Hello, everyone. This interview with Michelle Lee is brought to you by Samuel Lawrence Foundation and the Coalition for Nuclear Safety. I'm Kathy Iwane, a board member of Samuel Lawrence Foundation, and I'll be your monitor, your moderator today. And I'd like to share today's meeting rules first and foremost. All participants will be muted during the presentation to avoid background noise. Please enter your questions for Michelle Lee in the chat box. All questions may not receive a live response, but we will work with Michelle to get responses at a later date. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on Samuel Lawrence Foundation's YouTube channel. Samuel Lawrence Foundation has worked on radioactive waste issues at San Onofre for the past 10 years and intends to continue to advance the science and community work it takes to safeguard our coast from hazardous materials. Samuel Lawrence is in the midst of a lawsuit to protect our coast and we are taking the California Coastal Commission to court. The powerful state agency should not have approved Southern California Edison's application to deconstruct the spent fuel pools at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. We are asking the court to overturn that approval and a, pro and a trial is expected in June. So it's my pleasure <clears throat> to welcome our esteemed speaker, Michelle Lee. Michelle is an attorney and an analyst with Promoting Health and Sustainable Energy in New York. It's called FASE. She serves on the board of directors of the Nuclear Information and Research Resource Service, NIRS, a nonprofit watchdog organization in Washington, DC. Michelle is a member of the International Nuclear Consulting Group, which analyzes nuclear related environmental risk, energy policies, economics, weapons proliferation, political science, public health, and environmental justice. She presented to the US Department of Homeland Security and the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board panel of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and was a public observer during radiation emergency response drills at Indian Point. She is submitted, she is the chief author of numerous state filings on nuclear issues submitted by environmental groups to federal and state agencies. Michelle visited the Soviet Union four years after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. While Michelle is not local to our San Diego or Orange County area, she may not be able to address all of our specific local concerns, but she does have a long history of studying the facts as they relate to energy policy and nuclear related environmental risk. If Michelle has not studied a particular report, she will let our audience know and decline questions. At any time, I encourage all of you to write your questions in the chat box. Samuel Lawrence staff and I will gather your questions and ask Michelle. Please understand that all questions may not receive a live response, but we will work with Michelle to get responses at a later date. Michelle, I'm more than pleased to pass it on to you for your much anticipated presentation. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, good to be here. So. Um, we just passed the 35th anniversary of Chernobyl this week. Last month, we had the 10th anniversary of Fukushima. Uh, we've had a full year plus of a global pandemic, <laughs> um, but also Earth Day. But also, we just had Earth Day. And it, it really strikes me, we are really, truly uh, living in an extraordinary time on this planet, uh, with literally the meaning of the word extraordinary. Um, and, and we really understand, maybe for the first time in our, our lives, um, how interconnected we are as humans, um, and how interrelated our systems are, our, our ec economies, our health, right? Um, goods, services, uh, everything is interlocking, right? And also very complex and fragile and fragile. Um, 
So what do we what do we do with all this as as we you know go forward and thinking of the rebuilding of of everything post pandemic and reordering our lives? So I think we have a a rare true opportunity to ch to make changes for the simple reason that we as, as humanity we've all experienced the same thing you know one way or another with more or less levels of tragedy and and mental health <laughs> and 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 wanting to kill our family members uh but but it also really makes us think well, what is it that we actually value right we're always on the, this rat race treadmill to do this to do that to, oh, i certainly am and what the pandemic certainly did for me is it made me think, you know what, my stuff, it's nice, but what I really, what I miss is, is having like lunch with a friend or going and grabbing a cup of coffee or, you know, taking a train and going in and, and joining a march or something, right? It's community. And, and that that reorientation of thinking i think provides us all of us you know people who are on this certainly are, are focused on environmental and energy issues it really provides us an avenue um for ch shifting the debate and so what i want to do here today is less give you answers than um give you some food for thought and ideas about questions right because it's really about questions and I propose we start with the following question, which is the broadest. What kind of world do we want? What kind of world do we want? And I think we should, my suggestion is that we use that, that huge overarching question as almost a, a lodestar, a, a guiding principle for how we evaluate and, and consider things and how we debate about, about various things. So getting down to, to, uh, to the more specific topic, we, there are two defining threats of the 21st century. One is nuclear and the second is climate change. And these are very tightly interlinked and that's the, the point, the sub point that I want to make here tonight. Um, and I'm going to sort of whip through topics and sort of in the line organization of safety, sec um, security, safety, economics, climate change, um, environmental justice, uh, waste and democracy, all, all in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, the whole thing. Okay, so, so you always hear right, the, um, the PR vibe. Is, is we, we need nuclear if we're going to deal with the climate, right? It's, it's either fossil or nuclear. Those, those are the choices. Uh, and those are act, that's an actual completely false choice. The actual choice is whether we're going to have fossil and nuclear or do the real leap to transition to renewables and, and efficiency and also changes in our consumptive habits, you know, it always goes under as, as, you know, reducing waste, but it's it's a lot more than that. And that goes back to the issue of life after COVID. Um, when you, you hear statistics put out of, oh, we need to have this and we need to have that, you know, stop and think, really? Do we really need that? You know, you know maybe we did need that uh, on the treadmill that we were on until 2020, but do we really need it now? Do we really want it now? You know, think in terms of e-waste, for, for example. Um, so another issue that I think is important to, to keep in mind um, when you're talking about nuclear is who's an expert? You know, I'm put out here as an expert. Am I an expert? No, because nobody's an expert. Because the idea that there is like one discipline or two disciplines or 10 disciplines, and the people who know those disciplines have the inside track on nuclear is absolutely false. This is, 
you know, other than agriculture, energy, but particularly nuclear because of, of the uh, weapons connection and because of the longevity of its waste product, um, the, nuclear intersects with, I mean, you name the discipline, medicine, biology, atmospheric sciences, emergency planning, law, politics, uh, you know, just marine biology, uh, you know, geology, hydrology. You, you can just go along the line. I haven't quite figured out how to connect it to dance, but I'm working on that one. Um, so, so you need network expertise. Uh, and that's one of the, honestly, things that I like about the, the nuclear consulting group, um, which is an international group, is that you have, you have doctors and you have physicists and economists and, and engineers. You also have social scientists and a few lawyers. Um, and if you, you know, people who are have just been labored in the trenches of, of the uh, the you know act what's normally seen of as the activist community, um, you know, but I don't know if you would call people who uh, oppose uh, you know smoking in a school as an anti-smoking activist. You know those people you do, would call people who care about health, right? You call advocates for health. Somehow with nuclear it's seen as like an anti. Um, and uh, frankly, I think that, that it is partly because, or largely because of the military connection. Um, it, it's, it's part of the boy, boys with toys, the big things that go boom. It, it, it's really cool, right? To say you're, you're, you're an environmentalist, you care about this, but you think nuclear should be part of the mix because you're so high in scientific, um, but it's not. It, it, it's honestly, it's an outdated, um, lumberous technology that is highly complex. And um, as I'll hopefully point out in more detail a little later, the complexity is one of the problems because you cannot have a system this complex in a, in, and, and deal with it, with it as an informed citizenry, right? It has to be by its nature, um, non-transparent and not comprehensible to people who do not want to spend you know 24 hours of, of every single day you know reading you know nuclear you know, papers okay so let me quickly just go into the, the global security and issue and the national security issue uh, which is usually talked about in terms of, of atomic weapons right and that's the real tight connection a nuclear power came out of the Manhattan Project, right? So, and that's still, you know, they're, they're Siamese twins. Uh, but I would actually propose a somewhat different take, which in my view, the real security issue is that it distorts relationship among nations. You have the haves and the have nots. You have the, it, you have, it distorts, Honesty, because people, have, countries have to keep their their programs completely or partly secret. It skews economic relationships. Um, it skews priorities in money and funding and military and what you're devoting your military and your humanitarian efforts towards. Um, and you have the other issue, particularly in, in countries now entering the fray, uh, of accidents and corruption and, and in co frankly, incompetence of novel players. I mean, the old players are, aren't particularly confident. Uh, you know, countries just starting that, that, you know, have problems keeping even the regular power plants running um, and have civic unrest, although I think America now falls into that, that category. Um, you really want to add into that area fizzle materials. So with, with security, I'm going to just put forth the question, not the answer, the question. Is the world full of fissile materials a safer world? Okay. So that's our security. Um, although I will add one thing. Um, I came into this area um, close to 20 years ago. Um, because of the security issue, because I, I, in 
you know, before nine, my life is pre-9-11 and post-9-11. Uh, and, and if you ever want to um, understand the fecklessness of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, as a regulator, um, you, you may want to reflect back, or, or if you don't know it yet, on the fact that even after the 9-11 Commission identified the fact that the, the original terrorist attack contemplated nuclear, hitting nuclear power plants, and even after it was identified that Mohammed Atta, who was the pilot of the first plane and who, who led the, the team in New York, had brought, had during his surveillance flight to the Hudson River in New York, uh, noticed Indian planes. And in a July 2000, 2000, um, uh, 2001 meeting in uh, Spain to part of their planning for the attack, he actually brought up, like, maybe we should change a target and hit that. Um, and, and that was next. Um, but even after Indian Point was specifically identified 24 miles from, Man from Manhattan, New York City, the NRC said, eh, you know, planes, that's not, our, that's not our issue. The rest of the government, that's their problem. Um, so I don't know what the threshold of danger in the security area would have to be uh, for, for the NRC not to, not to you know, accept a, a, a site for, for a plan. Um, and, I, and I would just add one other thing on security is airplanes are so 2001. Cyber. Cyber attack is the absolute area of risk now, and it's an area of safety issue. Um, we, the, I, you could don't do a two-hour lecture on that without a problem, but we're going to jump over that because we're doing an overview. Um, safety. So, so here's the question to ask on, on safety. Um, if it's as safe as the industry says, why then does the industry refuse to insure it? And why does the insurance industry, which is the independent arbiter of risk, no skin in the game, will not insure against a radiological accident? If you also take out your, your insurance policies for your homes or your businesses or even your cars, you will note an exclusion that relates to radiological activity. And the Price-Anderson Act, which gives you that gives the industry the liability protection, was a 1957 act, even before I was born. And it was, you know, it, it made sense at the time because the idea was, oh, the industry would be would, once it shows how safe it is, then we wouldn't need to have public assuming liability, then the industry and the insurance industry will just come in with their policies. So that was 1957. We're now in 2021. That has not happened. And in fact, the industry is now planning to ask for Price-Anderson protection for its so-called new advanced reactors and small modular reactors. So the, don't ask don't listen to what the big boys say. Look at what they do. And look what the insurance industry is willing to do. Um, with safety, you also have the issue for the older reactors, um, the most basic engineering 101, which is the bathtub curve. Um, the bathtub curve, shaped like a bathtub, right? Uh, is, you know, applies to, to many, many engineered systems. So in the beginning, uh, of the, the existence of, of the in, you know, plant or, or washing machine or car, or whatever it is. If you have the kinks running, you know, coming up, um, you had, uh, you know, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island were both new plants. And then you have this period at the bottom of the curve where the, the, the operations run relatively smoothly. And then you have the end of the curve, which is closer to the, the planned obsolescence of the machine. And that's when you have other problems start to arise. Um, Fukushima 
had been relicensed for an additional 10 years of operation, uh, a matter of weeks before the Fukushima accident. And while that wasn't you know, the complete reason for the accident, um, some of the citing I considerations which were made in the early days um, were very much uh, relevant to, to the way the accident unfolded. Um, the, and the other issue with older plants, and we'll, we'll get to SMRs later, I'm sure, in the question and answer, with older plants, they can't run economically. They are running based on subsidies. We have subsidized this industry to the hilt. Um, according to the Department of Energy, uh, something like 75% of all funding for ener electricity it, related systems, including grid, including efficiency, including all different kinds of renewable, and even including fossil, 75% has gone to nuclear. So, you know, if you're going to be putting all the money in something and it still can't operate, without asking for more and more subsidies, um, that's something to think about when you're talking about the whole question and, you know, do you want our money as citizens and businesses to go for something like healthcare or renewable energy or refurbishing buildings or putting solar panels on schools or do you want it to keep going into the pockets of multi-billion dollar uh, mega corporations, um, which have never, ever, ever anywhere in the entire world been able to stand on their own two feet economically. So if you're talking about free market, nuclear fails the test. Um, and I'll tell you a very brief little story about my experience in New York, um, because I was a, a pro bono attorney on the case. Um, back in 2014, New York State came out with this like phenomenal reforming energy vision. And it was all about going renewable and efficiency and adding bike lanes. And it was just, just lovely. Uh, and then in 2015, New York came out with the New York State Energy Plan, you know, to try to effectuate that vision. And that's, and I, I got involved as actually one of the official interveners in that proceeding. And I was so excited and I wrote all sorts of comments with high gluten language about transformation to a cleaner New York and all that. Um, but what happened, uh, what happened behind the scenes? Because suddenly in 2016, the, what was uh, a named a large scale renewables proceeding suddenly got a different name. And, and out of the blue came the proposal for very large subsidies for New York's nuclear power plants that with the ending point closing, all would go to Exelon Corporation, uh, a $34 billion conglomerate which operate, which was heavily, most heavily invested in nuclear and fossil fuels. And, um, and, and what ultimately happened with that is the plan that, that New York came out of gave a $7.6 billion subsidy to Exelon, more than twice the amount that went to all renewables together, and it completely cut out efficiency. Now, not surprisingly, very soon after that, Exelon took over the distribution of the New York gas distribution. So it was now going to be making money uh, from the fossil and from nuclear, and it kicked, elbowed out of the way, renewables and efficiency very, very brilliantly. Um, and, and so here's a little tidbit that came out of the New York State Joint Commission on Public Ethics in 2017, a year after uh, the New York State Public Service Commission gave its big bailout to Exelon Corporation. So I'm just going to read a quote. And this is a, a, a report on, on registered lobbyists in New York. 
during the year 2017 and with, with money basically going backwards because when you're doing lobbying, you're paying bills after the work was done. Some of the largest retainers paid to lobbyists in 2017 related to nuclear energy. However, the largest retainer came from the Nuclear Energy Institute, a nuclear industry trade group. The ads were placed in an effort to support zero emission credits for nuclear power plants. And that's how they were sold to New York. Paying Exxon money was sold as zero emission credits, which they are not. And now we'll go into the, uh, the short PowerPoint and focus on the climate change issue. So if you can pull that just up the PowerPoint. Okay, how do I get out of me here? All right, so um, a real key issue when you're thinking about how you're, you're gonna combat climate change and ameliorate the, the conditions of climate change, right? Because if you're gonna ask why you wanna fight climate change, you have to start with the question, well, why don't we want climate change? right? So some of the reasons we may not want climate change is you don't want the actual heating of and, and destruction of waterways, because that water is, is obviously um, one of the you know, necessary elements of uh, life habitability of the planet for all living things. Uh, and human beings are very dependent on being able to have water that, that uh, that we can drink and use for agriculture and so forth. Uh, turns out that nuclear reactors uh, pump into their respective source waters, and all of them have to have source waters because that's used for the cooling. So many of them are lakes or rivers or ocean front. Uh, billions of BTUs, actual literally thermal pollution energy. And this photo on top is a um, it's an infrared photo of that, that river keeper, um, one of the environmental groups in New York um, in the Hudson that's, that's fought against in Dune Point, took when they did a, a, a um, helicopter flight over the plant. So the, the thermal plume coming up from the upper right is from Indian Point, and, and the other plume is from a plant that was closed, that was a coal plant. Uh, but the Indian Point, plume you'll see goes almost across the entire Hudson River. And the, the amount of actual heat is actually the BTU equivalent, if you're thinking these plants are operating all year long, of, of basically just implode, imploding nuclear bombs in your rivers and lakes and, and, and ocean. Um, and, and the thermal pollution, as just a sort of interesting aside, uh, also contributes to algal blooms, and algal blooms create methane. So you have this little weird uh, indirect uh, aspect too. Um, another thing of that vision, which goes to, frankly, a bald-faced lie of the industry uh, that they did not dispute during our litigation. They sidestepped it. Um, but they never disputed it, and that's really key. Uh, as a litigator, I can tell you, you're always looking forward when you're putting forth a proposition. Does the other side deny it and put forth evidence, or do they just try to sidestep it and evade it and, and create confusion? Uh, and the industry did not put forth evidence. We went against, you know, Exelon Corporation and the NEI on this. Uh, Nuclear, at, even at the phase of creating fission, is not carbon free. It creates carbon 14, which is radioactive carbon. Um, and it lasts for over 5,700 years. Um, and so carbon is carbon. Just because it's radioactive does not make turn it into a non greenhouse gas. Uh, it also, of course, is a co key component of all living things. So it is absorbed in the human body. It is absorbed in plant life. Um, it is absorbed in rivers and oceans and lakes into the aquatic life. 
and can bioaccumulate as it, as it winds itself up the nuclear, um, uh, up the food chain. So if you go to just the next page, of the slide, the next slide. Okay. So this is just really fast. The other issue with emissions of nuclear, um, if you have to look at the, the full nuclear fuel cycle, that, uh, that's the case with frankly all forms of, of, of energy production, even solar, even wind. You have to look at you know what kind of mining inputs there are, what, what's the transportation bur burden, what's the waste distribution burden, what's the, uh, you know, all the different processes that go into any kind of, of a human activity are going to have some sort of a, a um, greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, and nuclear is actually pretty substantial. If you and, and the other thing that, that along these lines, before we go to the next slide, that, that people have to keep remembering and frequently forget, when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions as a pollutant, it is not a localized pollutant, right? Like mercury. When you worry about mercury, you worry about the area, you know, lakes and streams and fish and so forth. But with, with greenhouse gases, the issue isn't how much is generated by you know any particular power plant or or um, other um, operational site. The issue is how much is generated overall by using that that technology and goes up into the atmosphere and circles our planet and creates the negative impact of climate change. So it's frankly irrelevant. Even if, which it's not, nuclear created no form of pollutants or, or carbon-14 during its, its genera electric generation phase, that's not really re the relevant question. The relevant question is, what's the overall contribution if you're looking at greenhouse gases? Um, and there are other greenhouse gases that are involved, but, but that sort of gives you the idea. And, and mining is extremely heavy. Um, carbon intensive, and the end of the fuel cycle, which is either sequestering nuclear waste for a million years, the, nobody can even fathom what level of contribution to, to the carbon cycle that's going to be. Um, but it's certainly going to be a lot, and it's going to be a lot in the near term as well as in the, in the long term. Next slide. So this just gives you sort of a, um, I like this slide, it's a, it's a nuclear um, energy institute slide done a few years back, um, just showing you where the nuclear waste sites are in the United States. Um, and you can see uh, California and Illinois and the, and the East Coast is, um, is pretty, <laughs> pretty heavily, uh, pretty intensely sited. So what you have now um, is 83,000 metric tons of uh, nuclear waste spent fuel um, be, uh, you know, it, that has to be disposed of. And nobody has figured out what to do with it. Um, Congress, in its infinite wisdom in the 1980s, came up with the idea that the public should have the financial uh, obligation of long-term of the ultimate disposal of nuclear waste, because back in the early days of the nuclear industry, they were just heady with their capability to do everything. And they just had some idea that, oh, we'll, we'll worry about that later. Let's just create the waste and generate the electricity. Uh, and maybe that made sense when you're talking about the technology, technological capabilities that we, we had in the middle of the 20th century. You know, maybe it made, it made sense, um, but that does not make sense anymore. We do not need to keep generating the waste, particularly since we don't know what to do with all the waste that we've already created. Um, next slide. I just see my time here. Okay, so this is just um, an issue with having to do with the fact that, that nuclear power actually accelerates um, climate change in, in various ways. 
Um, but the main way, which, which isn't listed here, but which has been um, really well elaborated on by many, including by Amory Lovins of uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and you'll have a link to um, a presentation that he gave at one of the congressional briefings um, that, that one of the groups I, I worked with um, gave last month, um, is that nuclear pushes aside other forms of generation. We're now technologically able, cheaper and faster and easier without you know, the security issues and the safety issues and the, the, you know, democratic process issues that you have with nuclear. We're able to get, get create the energy we need um, with renewables and battery and storage um, at this point. So why dump more money, you know, to keep either of the old reactors going? Um, I think that if you simply eliminated subsidies to fossil fuels and nuclear, you would see the clean energy transformation take off like a rocket. Okay, next slide. And that's just, yeah, can And then of course there's cancer and, and health effects, which I haven't even talked about. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, I love this. I, I just, I got this um, recently from, um, a colleague <laughs> in Europe. So this is uh, this is part of the wondrous nuclear industry PR machine. Uh, here you you have one of their little astroturf groups that they call Mothers for Nuclear, um, and I just love that that photo. You know, because I said, yeah, what 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 else would you want for your newborn infant? Than to just have that 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 new new child just surrounded with ionizing radiation, right? That's that's what as a mother I can speak. My, you know, the minute I had my kids, I'm like, God, I hope they get they they they're just bathed in radioactivity. Um, anyway, so that that's the end of those slides. Um, uh, and by the way, there's uh, a, a report which I will give you a link to, but um, uh, Benjamin Sofa Cool and colleagues came out at the end of last year with, an, with a really interesting um, study. It's called Differences in Carbon Emissions Reduction Between Countries Pursuing Renewable Electricity Versus Nuclear Power. Um, and it was published in the journal uh, Nature Energy. Um, but what they did was an analysis of countries that have nuclear versus countries that don't and how rapidly they were moving towards renewables. And you know, lo and behold, uh, as would be indicated by the, my experience in New York with our bailout, um, the countries that were not diverting money to keep nuclear plants going, were putting the money into renewables and efficiency and modernizing their grids. Um, so, okay, so that's, let me just go into um, one issue that, that I've only come into really in the last couple of years. Um, and I've just found appalling beyond belief. Um, and that really has to do with the environmental justice aspect um, with, with this incredibly ill-conceived notion that's popped up now and is being pushed very heavily by the industry of having interim nuclear waste dumps, right? So there are two that are being proposed, uh, one in Texas and one in New Mexico. And it perhaps will not come as a great shock to folks that both of these sites are in environmental justice, low income, majority minority communities. Um, and, and let's put all the other issues aside. Ethics, ethics, is it, is it ethical, is it moral as a society that we want to take our, the, the most dangerous toxic product humanity's ever created, move it all around the country, you know, let's go into to the safety and security issues with that in a minute, and dump it 
on low income minority communities. Essentially what you're doing is you're just carving out areas of the country and making them sacrifice zones, which they are already because those are all, that they're also in the Permian Basin. So they're, they'll be getting hit on every single end, you know, with, with, with the microparticulates and all the toxins that come out of mining and, and fossil fuel operations and in heavy industrial activity. Um, they already are heavily burdened by other kinds of, of nuclear um, operations, including nuclear labs. Uh, and now you're going to dump our nuclear waste. The, the greatest inventory of radioactivity on the planet in this one area of the United States. Uh, I would really love somebody to, to explain to me how that that is an ethical thing to do. Um, and let, let me, before I go to questions, just bring up one other point, which I think is really important. Um, when we're talking about what kind of world do we want, and make it what kind of country do we want? And what kind of countries do we want other, how do we want other countries to act and behave? Uh, and one real problem with nuclear is that by definition, it has to be operated by huge mega corporations. You cannot have a mom and pop nuclear power plant. So if we're, thinking now about creating a society where there's less, then more distribution of assets and, and ability of people to start businesses and the capability of communities to get involved in changing their energy systems and the way that, that their, their lives and quality of lives are structured. Do we want to go in a direction which has to, has to not allow essential true public input and participation. Again, what kind of world do we want? And so let's, uh, that, that's my little spiel and then we can go to questions now. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, wow, yes, very, very well delivered. Um, I would like to transition to Q&A, and um, first one we have is from Pamela Nelson. At what frequency do New York ratepayers pay the subsidies? Are they per year or something else? It's been woven into to your, 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 your monthly electric bill, and, and of course it doesn't identify what it is. If you look at your electric bill and you don't know like what you're paying for, it just gets put, it, it, has, it doesn't say nuclear. And, and what was great about the whole process is in the public um, announcements and, and for, because they had all these public meetings um, for, for this proceeding, uh, they, they usually left out in, in, in their um, public relations uh, like information packets, the fact that, that part of the, the subsidies would go to nuclear. That just sort of somehow dropped off that's the same for us in San Diego. It's crazy. Um, we have another question from Marilyn Swenson asking um, Michio Kaku adds the escape of viruses from labs to his three major threats to the world along with nuclear and climate change. Your thoughts on that? Uh, before I answer, I have to digress. He uh. came and spoke, he spoke at one of our, our very early presentations um, when we were really just getting going on Indian Point. And by the way, Indian Point is closing today. I, I'm on a, a, after this, uh, later tonight, I'm on a presentation for the closing of Indian Point. Um, but he came to, to one of the big issues early on uh, was the, the energy, the operator of Indian Point w was really, really in the defensive mode after 9-11 um, because Nobody paid attention to Indian Point before 9-11. It, it was, I wasn't paying attention to Indian Point before 9-11. After 9-11, um, many members of the public, including the West Point Military Academy uh, folks, police, firefighters, public officials, I mean, everybody was at, whoa, they can attack a nuclear plant. 
Um, and so Entergy was putting out, it, you know, had its PR team go in full force, and um, they were arguing that, oh, you would only have radioactivity spread, you know, at, to the EPC, the, the, the 10 mile line. In fact, one of their um, quote unquote experts who had, who had previously worked with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, Herschel Spector, came and spoke at a presentation and said, You only have to really worry about three miles if there was a nuclear meltdown. Um, but but Michio Kiku, in his presentation, he, he said, This is an amazing new like, area of physics I had no awareness of. You know, up to 10 miles, radioactivity. And then at the 10 mile mark, no radioactivity. Um, and as so, so with the virus, um, like new, like radioactivity, it's, you can't see it. You can't smell it. You don't know if it's there. Um, you can panic about it or be in denial about it or go back and forth or be somewhere in between. Um, but it can come from many places. And when you get the, if you happen to ingest or inhale a particulate um, or more than one particulate of, of any of these things, um, you, you really can't tell where it came from, for sure, um, unless you have the, the scientific expertise to, to really identify its characteristics and know and have the open transparency of, of the actors who might have participated in the transmission. And whether you're a scientific lab or a private corporation, um, your tendency is not to want to advertise that you might be complicit in killing a lot of people. Um, I have no idea. I don't know, it could have come from that. You know, I, when I've been going through files, because now that Indian Point's closing, I'm, I can get rid of some of my, my clutter. And I keep finding documents that I saved years ago when everybody was really frantic about the Ebola pandemic um, or epidemic, which is coming a pandemic and, and bird flu, right? Um, what if you have two of these activities happening at the same time, um, you know, for instance, during the, the horrific wildfires that California and Oregon um, experienced this year. Um, with, with, you had that during a pandemic, people had no idea what to do. They, they weren't getting communication because communications were down. Um, people, died because of, of, you know, being trapped in cars, trying to flee. What if you had, in addition to that, some sort of a radiological emergency? What if, you're talking about security and, and not just from external sources, but from domestic terrorism, what if somebody decided, I'm going to exploit a crisis like a wildfire during a pandemic and, and do do whatever nonsense I can at a nuclear site and see what happens. Exactly. Um, Michelle, in the interest of um, being able to answer several questions we still have, I see that we are now at 1220. And officially, this, um, this webinar ends at 1230. Are you amenable to continuing um, 10 or 15 minutes longer? Oh, sure. No problem. Thank you so much. OK. So we have another question from our coalition, and that is, have you identified any areas of potential progress on nuclear regulation in the law? You have a long career, so. Opposite direction, honestly. I, like, especially in the last four years. I, and, and also what's happened is you've had a lot of, um, retirements of some really good people um, at the NRC um, and they they haven't had the funding you know much less the inclination to replace them with, with you know the people that that 
um, had the institutional knowledge as, as well as the scientific expertise. Yeah, wow. Another question from our coalition. You have significant experience appearing before major agencies related to nuclear power. Do you have any advice for informed citizens to take action on these issues? Uh, okay. Uh, well, there, there's the inside baseball track, which, which if you join, you know, we'll put out a list of different organizations, you know, uh, on, the, um, on the site here. But, you know, Beyond Nuclear, NEARS, um, both of those organizations if you join them, you can join them very cheaply, $25 or whatever. You can get emails which give you action alerts and let you know what's happening. There are also some really, um, really amazing new um, coalitions of activis activism forming um, around the nuclear waste issue. Um, there's, there's a new nuclear, uh, radioactive, like a radioactive um, waste a coalition that's that's in the that's actually just formed this year um, of, of reactor communities and communities that are being targeted with waste um, all around the country that are are now interrelating on, on a weekly basis and sharing information. Um, I I find it just sort of um, sort of really interesting from a just balancing meme point of view. Um, that that you know many of the people here are, are from California, right? And San Onofre and Diablo Canyon, Canyon and Indian Point, you know, on the two coasts, you know, these plants both all, on both coasts were built. I, I, you had to wonder what the heck people were thinking when they sided them. Yeah, you know, Earth. We have earthquakes. Um, we have actually three to interact. With are believed to be a still active earthquake um, active zones in under Indian Point, and they had the brilliant idea of adding high pressure gas pipelines that transverse the site. Um, you have in, in California, obviously, even hot, much more of an earthquake, you know, issue and tsunamis. Uh, you know, so it, so the, the fact that these plants are closing, and that you have the activist, fairly sophisticated populations on the coasts that not that are still active even after their own plants are closed. Um, I think once you get involved in this area, and partly because it's just so interesting and relates to so many different disciplines. Um, you, you sort of don't want to let it go. You, you, you feel like you have an obligation to continue. Um, we have a question from Adam Weissman who asks, does much of the carbon-14 from fission end up bonded as carbon dioxide? <laughs> I, we don't, I don't think we know. Um, and by the way, they don't require monitoring of it coming to, out of the stack. Which is where the um, which is where most of it appears to come in. It, it, it's in the spent fuel as well. Uh, in fact, one of the issues with the release of uh, contaminated water from Fukushima is that they've ju just discovered this in the last couple of weeks that it 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 doesn't just have tritium, which is radioactive water, right? H three. It it also has carbon fourteen. So the idea of releasing all the, the you know barrels and barrels and barrels of of tons and tons and tons of of contaminated water into the Pacific, on top of the other contaminants that that, that have gone in, um, is is really of concern because that can go into fish. Um, the focus on carbon fifteen historically has always been just on you know taking little samples. From like at, on the site maybe, or you know by a river because because of the bioaccumulation issue. Um, if years ago nobody was even thinking about uh, carbon fourteen as a greenhouse gas, they were only thinking about the impact on health. And since the impact on health has been long considered a problematic, um, I would imagine it it's a problem. 
Yeah. The industry doesn't deny that that's a problem. So. Fantastic. Um, Massimo Greco provided a link in the chat and we're paraphrasing his question. It appears that the EU, European Union leaders may label nuclear power as a green investment. What is your advice to argue against that propaganda to falsely label nuclear as green? Um, I, I mean, that, the, the, what kind of world do you want? And, and the ethical issues, um, I think are the strongest way for certain countries that are, it, it's a real tough battle. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for weighing in in, in op-eds and in letters to the editor, um, but it, it's hard because we're up against, you know, how much of the 7.6 billion that Exelon got in New York did it use to, you know, then it was, you know, in, in its pocket effectively to go, which it did within a matter of a month or so, to Illinois to get the bailout in Illinois. Right? right, the money that goes to this industry doesn't get segregated in a separate pot for them to use to make the world pretty. It goes to be used to do what is good for their shareholders and investors and, and executives. Mm -hmm. Linda Seeley asks, do dry casks interim spent fuel storage installations, we call them ISPACES, emit carbon-14? gets back to your first I honestly don't know um, and I haven't seen any specific address to that question I would imagine it has to because carbon-14 is a gas so any gaseous emissions um, would be released uh, the, the, the more serious question is what happens um, you it, it, New Mexico and Texas these are areas that are drying um, the water from the little water that comes from rain um, will go into through these these systems. So any kind of cracks and leaks will ultimately trickle also into the waterways. And it's not just carbon fourteen. You're talking about strontium and cesium, you know, and uh, radionuclides that, that are toxic for centuries. And it's going into waterways. And, and aquifers that are already under threat, you know. So any additional toxic impact is really problematic. Um, around both sites, also you have grazing of cattle. Um, so you really want that milk that those cows are grazing in on to become a part of our um, supply that we see feed our children and toddlers. I wouldn't. Diane Turco asks, in your view, what is the best plan for the storage of nuclear waste? Stop making it. <laughs> um, that's, that's the easy answer, but it's, you know, stop, in a hole, stop digging. Um, I think you have site considerations, particularly at San Onofre, um, where you, there's an urgent need to, to relocate it further away from the shore. Uh, it's, it's nuts. Um, how that was ever allowed, and it's, it's so mind-bogglingly idiotic. I, I, I don't, I can't, I can't understand it. Um, the, the canisters, as um, Donna Gilmore, of uh, um, you know, has has brought out. Many of us probably know her, um, have, have heard her her presentations. Um, the canisters. The, Holtec uh, has a 25 year warranty. It's only, these cancers have only been around um, and they're different models, of course, for, for you know, for around 25 years. Um, and, and nobody, and the industry seems really interested on having Price Anderson continue to protect its liability. Uh, all of these um, waste sites are, are structured with these LLC and joint venture um, legal structures which are designed to simply protect the the assets of, of their their main you know investors there, there's nowhere to, to go against these companies nowhere 
if, if something goes wrong. Um, that, that's been one of the issues we've had in New York with, with Entergy transferring the Indian Point site and the ISFSI at Indian Point to Holtec. Holtec, for decommissioning, right? Holtec has never decommissioned a single nuclear power plant site. <clears throat> and its whole model now is this grab from multiple sites, its, its fleet approach. So imagine in the early phase of you know of airplanes you know in the early 1900s you know having going for a fleet approach when you've never actually built a plane yet right but you're going to build lots of planes all at once and then if things go wrong you'll figure it out uh, and then you know part of this also is then taking that that the the trust fund money because there's no capitalization put in by the company. So all the capitalization is from the, the trust fund money that was paid in by the public. Um, and then, of course, Holtec wants to move waste to New Mexico and the low-level waste to Texas. Um, and then where, where the, the federal government is supposed to pay for the transportation risks, and then the federal government takes over the waste risks, which is very nice for, you know, Holtec, but not for the public. Far Farah Mars wonders, are there any web pages you've found that focus on the environmental justice angle of nuclear energy contaminating indigenous people and their lands in the US? This is a huge issue that no one's looking at. Many, um, and I, I, when, you, when I give you sites to put up after, the, the, after this webinar, um, I can give you a lot on that. Um, the, the indigenous peoples are fighting this with all their might, with all their might. And as Leona Morgan of the Diné, um, the Navajo, which we, we called Navajo Nation has said, this is nuclear colonialism. This is nuclear colonialism. You know, they, they, it started with the mining and you have over 1500 abandoned uranium mines still in on, on the, the, those areas and many of which are in the Navajo Nation. Um, uh, reservation areas um, that, that have been contaminating their their peoples for decades uh, that still aren't cleaned up. Yes, please, everyone, follow Leona Morgan. She's absolutely um, on this issue, congressional briefings, everything. So, and, and I'll just add this on the congressional briefing link that of the congressional briefing we did on March thirtieth. Mm -hmm. um, she's the first, uh, I guess, Tim Judson, right after him, is Leona's presentation. And when you go to the ESI site, you can you don't have to go watch the whole um, congressional briefing. You can pick uh, the people to watch. And I would definitely suggest Leona Morgan and then um, Ingrid Lovins, who gave the, the final presentation and, and talked about, you know, the, the, the economic uh, case against nuclear you know, as opposed to going into renewable. Yes, it's been said that we reap the electrons and the, the disenfranchised people of colored tribes uh, get the waste and that's just not good. Um, so let's see here. Um, Farah Mars also said NIRS has a good web page debunking nuclear as a climate solution. Are there any other pages you recommend that demonstrate nuclear is not a climate solution? I will give you some um, citations for, for actual studies, peer review published studies. Um, the, the Solutions Project also has a great web page on that. I think they have something like 73 um, links to studies that, that they've, they've collected. Um, their, their, their page probably may be one, one of the best if you're looking for the actual you know, peer-reviewed science documents. I, and I would, again, go back to my New York example. Um, there's a common sense aspect of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you think that nuclear is, is completely safe, uh, which the industry doesn't, but, it, but all these other issues, money. You know, where are we going to put our money? And since renewables are cheaper already, I mean, that's not a question anymore. They're cheaper, they're faster. You can put up, 
wind turbine, you can put up, you know, solar panels very rapidly. You can put up wind turbines in a, in a you know, few years. And, and certainly efficiency and, and um, going back to what kind of world do we want, it, all, it really goes into issues of design and, and buildings and, and do we want to put money into more parks, you know, or, or more roadways, right? Right. Um, Priscilla Starr asks, what can be done to stop Holtec? North Star and similar companies from getting all the contracts across the U.S. to manage this waste. This is huge. I think we have to. We have a window of opportunity now. We have a new administration and many on um, new uh, people in Congress who uh, have the best intent. Some have a really great intention, but are not particularly well educated on these topics. Um, and the the reason why the congressional briefings were done were to try to get them aware. Um, bug the heck out of, of your Congress people. You know, if you can find their phone numbers, <laughs> you know, and you call and you say, I, you know, I would like to do this or I'd like to talk about that. Um, you know, what, you know, what are you doing to stop the funding of, of dirty fuels as opposed to non fuel based? clean resources, you know, how much of the, of the money of this ta uh, town are, are you, you planning to, to divert to, to a large corporation? You know, are you even aware of that? You, 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 you can really play with this issue because it connects to so many things, um, but particularly to economics and budgets. Right, right. Um, okay. Schools. I mean, schools need money now. You know, why are you diverting money? away from schools, yeah. right? And away from making schools safer for students to return. And it's just about picking up the telephone and finding those connections yourself, which is very, very difficult at times. We can't, it's not all about signing a petition and yeah, definitely. Bill Wagle asks, is the lack of safe long-term storage part of a global depopulation agenda? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, simply based on the fact that uh, you, you know, from a point of view, it's conspiracies, and they, you know, look, we have all you've seen them <laughs> in recent years. Um, you really have to look at how many actors are involved, and what would be the, the ease or difficulty of keeping things hidden, and there, things don't stay hidden very well. And this, I'm going to have to draw the line at this last question and any others that don't get attended to, we can work with Michelle later to answer them. Sarah Mosca wonders, in your opinion, what is Bill Gates' real motivation for his pushing new nuclear, in your opinion? I think as we all have our biases and if you're an engineering mind, that's focused your entire life on engineered solutions, big, fancy, high-tech engineered solutions to things. Um, you, you tend to be very excited and enthralled with big, high-tech, complex engineered solutions. And you don't have to go into any other nefarious, you know, it, it, and, and frankly, why are we giving uh, millions of dollars of public money you know, if he loves his his project so much, fund it. Great, you have you have enough money. You know, don't go to the public. Exactly, exactly. I will. Um, that's all the questions we currently have, and so I would like to finally go to the closing. Um, get toward the closing now. And just remind you that there are several actions you can take to support SLF's lawsuit to protect our coast. Um, a reminder that your support is what makes this work, work possible. Please, um, if you're interested, find your way to samuellawrencefoundation.org today and we, where we can continue to provide this amazing content. We're so grateful for all that you've enlightened us with today, Michelle. You can go to Samuel Lawrence uh, website and donate on that page or give a gift. 
Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and most importantly, the Coalition for Nuclear Safety and Samuel Lawrence Foundation ex extends our gratitude uh, to you for making yourself available to us today and sharing your wisdom with the community. Once again, congratulations. Today is the last day you're offline at Indian Point and I can, I can only say kudos to you for your role in uh, your long role in all that that entailed. Um, my daughter, personal note, lives 18 miles away from that plant. So it's very meaningful today to have you with us. Um, thanks also to uh, the coalition, our coalition, for your collaborative efforts to make this happen. And to today's participants, um, you're wonderful, great questions, fabulous uh, exchange. Uh, we've given everybody the ability to unmute yourself so you're now able to share your words of gratitude and a healthy round of applause for Michelle. Thank you. 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 Thank